Now, welcome to video three. Um, in video one, I had explained to you what we mean by top line, exactly what parts of the horse's body that involves. In video two, I showed you some examples of good top lines, not so good top lines, so you can um, compare those to your horse's top line and see where he or she stands and which parts of the top line are well developed, which ones need some work. And now in video three, we want to show you the typical rider mistakes that um, compromise the development of the top line, that prevent the horse from building the right muscles in the right places. So for this video, we ask our working student to demonstrate the mistakes. She doesn't normally make them, right? she's a good rider and uh, knows <laughs> how not to make those mistakes, but uh, just uh, as an illustration, she'll, she'll ride badly on purpose. <laughs> So, in our last video, we talked a lot about the uh, connection between the horse's conformation and the muscle development. Um, as a rule of thumb, you can say that the muscle development uh, of the horse is determined by uh, the posture in which the horse spends the most amount of time. It's obvious, you know, the, the muscles that are being used the most will grow the most, the, horse, uh, the muscles that are not used or used the least, they will not grow, not develop, or they will atrophy, they will get smaller, actually. So horses that spend most of their time in a healthy posture will have good muscle development, they will use all the right muscles, so they will look nice and round in all the right places, and uh, um, all the unhelpful muscles, so to speak, will become you know smaller, and uh, um, there will be no uh, tension, no, you know, negative tension bracing in, in the body. The more harmonious the build, the more uh, balanced the horse's build, the easier it is for him to carry himself in good balance and to use the right muscle. So it's easy for a horse with good conformation to access the right muscles. It's easy for the horse with good conformation to go in balance, straight, self-carriage and so on, and then to relax as a result of that balance so the job is easy for the well uh, for the horse with good conformation and if the horse finds good posture easily you know then it's easy for, the job is easy for the rider as well so on those horses you you typically see the the right muscle link develop fairly quickly and fairly easily you know and uh, uh, the the rider's job is not that difficult but on the other hand when you have a horse that has uh, difficult areas in the conformation, um, like a narrow, weak back or a difficult translate, uh, transition from the loin into the pelvis when there's a, a ridge, for example, then uh, it will be difficult for the horse to lift his back and uh, go through the back and, and release the pole. So he will always tend to drop the back and over elevate and engage the under neck and stay tight in the pole. So for that horse, it'll be much more difficult to find the right muscles, use the right muscles. It'll be much more difficult for the rider to help him into that posture because of course the, the presence of the rider's weight on the horse's back has the effect of <laughs> pressing down on the, on the back because of gravity. And uh, so that can make it very difficult sometimes with some horses to uh, find a good balance and to lift the back and release the pole and stretch the top line, you know, so by lifting the withers and releasing the pole. Um, so conformation always plays a role. Um, when you see horses with not so great muscle development, they're very often horses that have certain conformational dif difficulties. When you see horses that uh, are difficult to ride on the bit, you know, by most people, um, then it, there's usually a conformational reason to why that is difficult. Whereas if a horse is really easy to ride on the bit, there's usually also a conformational reason for that. So the other side of the equation is the rider, of course, the rider's seat and the rider's aids. Um, ideally, the rider should help the horse find his balance and should guide the horse in such a way that he's aligned on the line of travel and that the weight is distributed ev distributed evenly and that the energy impulses of the hind legs can travel through the spine um, from the hind legs to the bit and back or to the bridge of the nose if you're riding with a bitless bridle same thing 
Um, and as riders, we want to channel the energy of the hind legs. And yeah, we want to direct the energy flow, recycle the energy from with the reins and the seat back to the hind legs. And if possible, we want to avoid getting in the way. We want to avoid disturbing the horse's balance or the horse's energy flow. And that's a lifelong task for the rider. It's not as easy as it sounds, right? Just just don't get in the way. <laughs> so just let the horse do his job. Don't get in the way. So yeah, if, if you have a very well-built, very well-balanced horse, then it sort of comes down to not, not getting in the way, letting the horse do his job. But if you have a horse with conformational issues or past poor training history, then staying out of the way, not interfering is not enough, but you have to actually help the horse and support the horse in keeping his feet on the line of travel, keeping the weight distributed in a, in a healthy way. And uh, um, so you support the energy flow with your seat, with your aids, right? so, so that you catch the horse as soon as he drifts off the track with his hips or shoulders or you know regulate when the horse changes the tempo the stride length and so and so on because the for the horse the foundation of balance and healthy movement is really uh, correct alignment on a correct arena pattern steady tempo steady stride length uh, tempo that's not too fast not too slow um, a consistent energy level that is appropriate for the gait and the movement you're riding not too high not too low right? if the energy level is too low then you don't have enough power and then uh, the horse won't be able to do what you want to do or he, the energy won't be able to to travel actually through the top line through the spine to the to the bit and back um, it's it's like if you don't have enough pressure in your garden hose then the water won't go very far you may not even reach the plant you want to water <clears throat> Because it's just a trickle, right? <clears throat> On the other hand, if you have too much energy in the horse, then he will be tense and he will brace. You know? So, and then <laughs> in the garden hose analogy, if you have like a fire hose with that much pressure, then you may blow your little plant out of the ground, right? And uh, destroy it with, with that much pressure. It's, it's a little the same. So you have to find just the right amount of water pressure. So the, the horse needs just the right amount of energy and impulsion for walk, trot, canter, you know, single track, shoulder in, half pass, pirouette, whatever, you know. So the higher the demand, the higher the energy output is that the horse needs to, uh, needs to have. And the rider can unfortunately interfere and hinder that energy flow and destroy the balance of the horse in, in a number of different ways, right? So we selected a few very typical, very common ones. Um, there are more, of course. Um, and uh, we'll, we'll talk about them briefly. Um, and we got our assistant um, to demonstrate the mistakes. She's actually quite a good writer. Um, and she was <laughs> kind enough to, to demonstrate bad writing, which is really hard, actually. If, you know, if you've conditioned yourself all your life to write well and to, not to make certain mistakes, and then you have to make them on purpose, it goes against every fiber in your body you know it's it, you really have to force yourself and yeah it's it's not the same as you know the beginner who just doesn't know any better who can't can't help himself right so for the for the good writer to write badly is really hard <laughs> so um yeah so there are a num number of mistakes what we didn't uh, show here is a, a, a writer who is yeah, unbalanced leaning left or right or forward or back or rider who's crooked and rotating the wrong way with a pelvis those are very common mistakes of course too um, and uh, but what what we um, thought we would show you are mistakes like uh, digging in your seat bones being tight in your hips gripping with the legs hanging on the reins um, riding the horse too too slow you know not riding forward enough and and you can see in the horse's reaction in all of those that it disturbs the balance it disturbs the energy flow the horse will then you know tighten the back drop the back invert you know and so on and uh, we only let her do it for a few seconds because we don't want to really confuse the poor horse too much right and uh, he's a tolerant horse so he's he's he can handle it for for 
short amount of time and then we you know always rode him normal again after demonstrating the bad the bad moments and uh, yeah in real life of course m usually people make more than one of those mistakes so you will have someone with tight hips who also then yeah, gets into a chair seat with too much weight on the seat bones and then they often grip with the legs to stabilize themselves so they don't fall off or they hang on the reins because they might be behind the movement right if, if hips are tight and you sit too much on your seat bones and your knees come up your lower legs come forward then you may have to stabilize by by hanging on the reins and so on so you you will normally see more than one of those in the same person yeah and uh, then of course there's a cumulative effect the more of these mistakes you make the more you interfere with the horse's movement and you now the less the horse is able to um, move in balance with you know the energy flowing through the, the body back to front and then return recycle the energy to the hind quarters so let's see we have let's start here with one here is not riding forward enough so here she starts with a normal tempo you see she's pretty you know active the horse is pretty active and now she has to make herself slow him down, which is really hard for her. And then you see already how the back drops and the head comes up. Yeah, so uh, if there isn't enough energy to actually travel through the spine to the bit, then uh, the, there's nothing to support the back, right? The back drops, the horse inverts. And here she was starting to ride a little bit more forward, it seems. And then, yeah, I take in here, I'm helping a little with the lunge room. So it takes a little while too after you've made the mistake and the horse has lost his balance, then uh, um, it, it takes a little bit before that energy and the impulsion is restored and the horse can regain his normal balance. So there, there's always a bit of a, a delay. Sometimes it takes a while, like when, when you're riding normally, you know, then the horse goes well, then you make the mistake, then it may take a few strides before the, this mistake shows up in the horse, right? It's the same thing when the horse is well trained and you put a weaker rider on the horse then it, the horse may go well for one ride and then you know the next ride he may not go so well because by that time the effect of the weaker rider is showing in the horse and then you know after the good rider comes back on <laughs> um you know it takes a while before the horse is going well again so here we have riding front to back so she was pulling on the inside rein so the, the idea was then to have her hold the reins too tightly so the horse would maybe overflex and, and get behind the aids and then you see how that kills the impulsion and so on and it gets slower and slower and you see how the the energy now is stuck in the back and doesn't really travel through i mean actually he's he's handling it pretty well so it's it doesn't look as as bad as it could in in, in other horses and i think she she just couldn't bring herself to hang more <laughs> on the rein because of course normally she doesn't and she's trying very hard to ride well and she does right so here we have tight hips um, a lot of people have that issue of stiff hips that's usually because they're not supporting themselves well enough with uh, the inner thigh knee seat bones they're not draping the or letting the weight flow enough around the um, rib cage of the horse so um, that tight hips also make the rider bounce of course she's still pretty happy and uh, pretty flexible in her hips. I don't think she is even able to, to really lock her hips like some, some people do. But you can see how the horse's back drops and the head comes above the bit and you see how she's sitting a little too heavily on, on her seat bones. And that tight hips usually mean um, the rider bounces and the hip um, the weight is too much on the seat bones and that uh, you know, bouncing, of course, is uncomfortable for the horse and then they drop the back. and. Uh, having too much weight on the seat bones is uncomfortable and you know a lot of people have been taught to sit very heavily on their seat bones and that can really interfere with the horse's movement especially if you have a horse that has a bit of a, a weak back now this horse is fairly sturdy overall in in his build but horses that are delicate in their backs you know they they will immediately drop the back and invert and um, either stop or some some horses bolt if you dig your seat bones in so that it hurts you know so here she, she's trying to dig the seat bones in it's not as drastic here you see it more right so with every attempt she tried to make it more extreme and, and uh, there there at the end you could see um, 
how the horse was then dropping the back more and in inverting more. Right? So when the good rider stretches their legs, stretches their knees, say there she starts out with a normal seat and then here she tr tries to dig the seat bones in and you can see it's, it's foreign to her. She almost doesn't really know how to do that anymore because <laughs> she trained herself not to. Right? So uh, um, here at the, at the end of the clip there you see how now all the weight on the seat bones is making the horse invert and it's it's interesting too when you do try all these mistakes with the horse you can see how they tolerate some mistakes better than others actually right and and that's again it has to, something to do with a confirmation in the temperament depending on how uh, strong the back is so a horse with a really strong back can handle the rider sitting heavily on the seat bones a little better somebody with a delicate back like if you if you did that on a saddle bread you know the, with a really narrow back they would probably immediately drop the belly to the ground and play giraffe you know this horse is, is pretty strong in his back so so he, he handles that a little better other horses this is the the gripping leg so the idea was to to grip with the calves right and there are some horses that will stop and kick your leg if you do that they they will slow down immediately he handles that relatively well so it's it's kind of an interesting thing but here you see uh, how um, he, then he braces the rib cage at some point when when you grip hard enough and long enough right and then he goes above the bit and tightens tightens the back yeah. some horses are really sensitive to people hanging on the reins and they will immediately fight and toss their head so every horse has their own um, rider mistake that they absolutely cannot handle you know and uh, where they get you know go ballistic and other horses are so tolerant that they still do their job more or less they just uh, do it a little less well than they could but some horses are absolutely i don't know outraged or terrified if if you make a certain mistake and then then they get really difficult and right? this one is, is fairly um easy going about it and, uh, but of course if you choose a horse that responds really really severely to certain mistakes then it will also take a while to fix that again you know once you've made the mistake right so that's that's also something to to keep in the back of your mind some horses will tolerate certain rider mistakes better than others um yeah some horses respond really severely to certain mistakes of the rider and uh, maybe are more tolerant of others right but uh, Essentially, all these mistakes interfere with the energy flow. They all interfere with the balance. They all interfere with the back movement or the with the correct use of the horse's body. And then, so so you will see a negative effect in all uh, from all of these mistakes. You know, some more, some less. Right? Some mistakes more than others. Some horses will respond more harshly than others. Right? So. Uh, yeah. So we, here we have hanging on the rein. That's the last one. And. Uh, yeah, there you see how the horse then engages the underneck and yeah it's, and then if you if you not only hang on the rein but now you, if you dig your seat bones in and maybe push the horse forward with your seat bones then uh, you push him very much on the forehand you push the withers into the ground you push the back down and then yeah the paw comes up and backwards at you you know and then uh, you develop the underneck and the, the back muscles atrophy as a as a result right yeah so these are all um, yeah, typical mistakes that happen. Um, go back to, uh, and like I said, most people make several of these mistakes. So here we have the more normal, you know, way of sitting and riding. And now she's she slows down just to, to show you um, that she she can actually ride better. <laughs> so. And uh, yeah, so I hope this was interesting. I mean, the numbers of number of mistakes we can make as riders is endless, of course, you know, then timing of the aids can be wrong, coordination of the aids could be conflicting messages, you know, that sort of thing. So there, there is an endless number, but we just wanted to show you some of the typical ones. Um, and you can see the, the negative impact the mistakes have on the horse's way of going. And then of course, if the rider interferes with the horse's balance and the energy flow in the horse every day you know consistently then uh, the horse doesn't have a chance to balance himself and to use his muscles correctly so he doesn't have a chance to build the right muscles but he will build the wrong muscles because they are 
you know, unhelpful muscular pattern, so to speak. Then there are certain muscles will be braced permanently. Other muscles that should be working are not, you know. So, um, yeah, and then you see the reflection of that in the development of the horse's top line as well. So I'm hoping you find this helpful. So in this video, um, we showed you six of the most common seat mistakes riders make, and these mistakes prevent the horse from using his back and his hindquarters properly, so they will lead to the top line atrophying. And uh, as homework, you can try and um, identify maybe if you are making one or two of those and uh, try to remember not to do them when, when you're riding. And uh, in the next video, we will explain to you why it's often most effective to yeah, build the top line, repair damage to the top line, not by sitting on the horse, but by doing groundwork like lunging, double lunging, work in hand, and long reining. So, we'll see you then.